after MPD officers stopped a car carrying four Somali-American teens, one officer told the teens, quote, Do you remember what happened in Black Hawk Down when we killed a bunch of your folk? I'm proud of that. We didn't finish the job over there. If we had, you guys wouldn't be over here right now. As everybody, everyone no doubt knows, this is a reference to the 1990s raid by American Special Forces in Mogadishu. That was Mara Garland this morning sharing a very disturbing anecdote included in the findings of the Justice Department's two-year investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. The DOJ launched its review in the wake of George Floyd's death and the murder conviction of Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis police officer who kneeled on Floyd's neck and killed him. Today, in a damning 89-page report, the Justice Department accused the Minneapolis Police Department of rampant use of excessive force, unlawful discrimination, and violations of constitutional rights. Here are more of the shocking examples of the abuses they discovered. In a review of 19 shootings from January 2016 to August of last year, investigators found, quote, a significant portion of them were unconstitutional uses of deadly force. At times, officers shot at people without first determining whether there was an immediate threat of harm to the officers or others. The report recounts the story of a woman who was shot and killed by an officer who was reportedly spooked when she walked up to his car to report a possible sexual assault. Investigators say the officers' policing practices changed depending on the neighborhoods they found themselves in. Quote, MPD disproportionately stops Black and Native American people and patrols differently based on the racial composition of the neighborhood without a legitimate related safety rationale. Investigators also found that Minneapolis police officers all often failed to take seriously the health complaints of the people they arrested. Quote, we found numerous incidents in which officers responded to a person's statement that they could not breathe with a version of, you can breathe, you're talking right now. You may recall that George Floyd's last words were, I can't breathe. Joining us now is Philip Atiba Goff. Dr. Goff is the chair of African-American studies and professor of psychology, Yale University. He's also a co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity. Dr. Goff, thanks for being here tonight. I feel like it's always a dark moment in America when we have these conversations. But I guess, you know, at this point, maybe it shouldn't be striking the, the animus, the deep-seated hatred some of these officers have for the community that they're supposed to protect. Um, what did you make of this report? Yeah, it, it's ugly. Um, if it doesn't shock your conscience, um, then you've been uh, looking at too much that's dirty for the soul. Um, it should feel shocking and disgusting and ugly. Um, what I made of the report is that it looks, first of all, thank goodness for Kristen Clark and for the good women, men, and bi non-binary folks in the special litigation unit that do incredibly thankless work that make this possible, that allow us to read this kind of stuff. Um, but also thank goodness for the men, women, and non-binary folks um, in the Minnesota um, Human Rights uh, uh, Department that did a very similar report and uh, that also led to a negotiated consent decree in the state back in March. I'm very glad that these kinds of things are available to um, communities that need something like remedy after all of this ugliness. But the thing that strikes me the most is that I'm hearing people talk about, well, this is some measure of justice and this is some measure forward without considering the scale of the problem. Mm. It's not just the ugliness of these incidents, but we have about 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the United States and the U.S. government at best, when it was doing the most of these under Obama, did about three investigations a year. We've got eight investigations open right now. You're not going to get to 18,000 three a year. And I got to say, Minneapolis, as ugly and disgusting, we worked there. I know that department very well. As ugly and disgusting as parts of it are, it's not in the top 50 worst police departments in the country. So if we're going to really yeah. solve what is a national level problem, we, we got to have more than just this one federal remedy for it. Well, yeah. And you point, I mean, can we talk also about consent decrees? I mean, there are more than a dozen police departments under consent decrees that go back decades. First of all, just... Tell me about what you, your general opinion is of dissent decrees. I think um, today that they plan to place the Minneapolis Police Department under a consent decree. To, to your mind, what is or how effective are they? And for people who don't really understand what they are, I mean, let's start with what, you, what they are and how effective they are. 
Sure. So in 1994, the much maligned um, uh, crime bill, the 94 crime bill um, that uh, Biden, for better or for worse, gets tons of credit for, gives the provision that the federal government can go and investigate and then um, <clears throat> use the, its power uh, to essentially regulate out of control law enforcement with an investigation and then a consent decree. The consent decree is the parties get together. They say, this is what we're going to do to solve all of these hideous problems that just came to light from the investigation. And usually there's a monitor that's put into place to regulate, yes, the department is in compliance with that. So the idea is that there's a plan that's negotiated that gets the department from the terrible place they're in to a better place. Um, it clearly has not fixed the departments that have been under a consent decree. Also, it is clearly better than nothing. There are things that happen under a consent decree, and both the folks in these communities and the law enforcement leaders that are there will tell you they couldn't have gotten done if the federal government didn't get involved. But it is weak sauce compared to the size and the scope of the problem in an individual department, much less the problem that we've got nationally. So while I'm glad that it happens, again, hats off to DOJ, civil rights, Kristen Clark and her team, um, it is – it is so small compared to what we we see and what we're literally reading about um, as to be another indictment on our capacity to hold departments and institutions accountable when they engage in such explicitly white supremacist violence. Well, yeah, and I and I think that was I, I wanted to get to that, which is well, you can't ignore the origins of policing in this country, the slave patrol origins, right? And the question is, and I know that this is act, I mean, it's asking sort of the impossible of you, but whether you think we are at the point in the conversation around criminal justice and policing and what it means to have a safe community, where policing in the 21st century will look different than it did in the 20th and the 19th centuries. So that is a moral question to the country you're asking there, Alex. Because if we want things to actually change, it has to. But do I think that there is enough momentum amongst our electeds? I, I, I got to say, um, I, I wish I felt more optimistic than I did. Um, we, we see experiment after experiment, initiative after initiative across the country, where instead of investing in more punishment, we're investing upstream. Right, investing in um, mental health resources, investing in uh, homelessness resources, which is to say housing, investing in after school programs. And lo and behold, we get less crime on the other end of that. So, what would it look like if we invested in care instead of punishment for our most vulnerable communities? We have no idea because as a nation, we have failed to do that. And if we don't, what I really worry about for this next electoral cycle, in fact, in 2024, is that just like we almost saw in 2022, there will be the same playbook where folks weaponize the fear of brown people coming to your neighborhood and committing crimes. And the result of that will be a further investment across the board, left and right in this country, um, in more punishment. We're going to see more of the same that until there's more investigations like this and more terrible readings like this that the attorney general reads out, we're going to pretend like we couldn't see coming when we've done this for literally hundreds of years in this country. Oh, the devastating, brilliant Dr. Philip Ativa Goff. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate your wisdom and perspective on this. Thanks for having the conversation, Alex.